set my lands in order. It was not the most salubrious of areas. Brock was not an orc who was easily intimidated, but even he was keeping a wary eye on the ramshackle tavern across the way. There were a trio of orcs there, either having a three-way pit fight or trying to kill each other. It wasn't clear which. He put his hand on the hilt of his scram defensively, the one he'd got from his first legion days back in Skarsind in 74. Ah, those were good times, he thought. Why have we stopped here? he demanded of the guide. This was not the sort of place to stop. To be fair to Beret, every city had a street like this, and every local quickly learned you didn't stop here. This is it, announced his guide, pointing at the spot between the tavern and what he guessed from the smell was a tannery. In between was a tiny parcel of open land with an old well to one side. This is it, said Brock, trying to keep his voice neutral and failing. It's all very well for the other civil servants to be all po-faced when they were working. They didn't have a voice in their head screaming at them to kick the cheeky fucker's head in. This is it, he repeated, letting his tone make his disbelief clear. Yes, said the guide innocently. Is it not big enough? he asked in a voice that dripped with insouciance. It was at that moment that the ring dropped, and Brock realised exactly what was going on. Well, it's big enough for me to take a piss in, he said laconically, pointing to the well. But I think we might need a bit more land than this. Oh, said Aesan's orc, in a voice of mock surprise. Well, how much land do you need? Here we go, thought Brock. Overview during the spring equinox 386YE, the Imperial Senate voted to assign Mareev to the Imperial Orcs. The first territory of the Broken Shore has been conquered, and this historic motion has doubled the number of territories the Imperial Orcs call their own. A wave of enthusiasm spread across the nation and prompted intense discussion among those Orc citizens in Skarsind as to whether they should uproot their lives and journey far to the south to make a life for themselves in the new territory. Of the six septs of the Imperial Orcs, the Sanite have shown the most enthusiasm for relocating to Mareev. The sept originated there, with gladiators and slaves liberated during the initial sack of Buri. Their numbers have been further swelled, friends and families recruited with the aid of the winter sun, more former slaves free by battlefield negotiations. All the septs are welcome in Mareev, but for those of the Sanite sept, the fact Mareev is now in Imperial Orcs territory has special meaning. Many choose to remain in Skarsind, where they have begun to build new lives far from the arid territory of their birth. Many more spearhead the diaspora from Skarsind to the Broken Shore. It seems especially fitting, perhaps, that as the true consecration of the Legion's rookery in honour of the founder of their nation is completed, the Imperial Orc Assembly urges preachers and pilgrims to lead the way in learning more about the challenges presented by this new territory and the people who live there. Note, the Golden Pyramid are also in Mareev this season, as detailed in the Digging for Fire Wind of Fortune. Challenges Four primary challenges for whichever nation was assigned the territory were detailed by the Civil Service last summit. They included opposition from the Grendel, the presence of other orcs who call it home, the challenge of building a home in a dry land with little fresh water, and the strategic complexities presented by such a far frontier. The first challenge to be faced, however, is also one of opportunity, the election of a senator to lead and represent the territory. Leadership Challenge At the summer solstice, the Imperial Orcs will decide on a senator for Mareev for the first time. The election for the inaugural Senator for Mareev will start at 2.15 on the Saturday, with candidates presenting their items of worth. The Senator for Mareev will serve a shortened term until the spring equinox 387YE, when the position is due to be re-elected. The Senator may be new, but the method of appointment remains the same. Imperial Orcs who live in Mareev are eligible to vote provided they lead a military unit that has supported an Imperial army in the last four seasons. An Imperial Orc receives a number of votes based on the quality of their troops and how often they have supported Imperial armies over the previous year. The challenge, identified by the Civil Service, is that, by law, 
If eligibility to vote in an election is restricted in some way, then you cannot vote if you were eligible to vote in an equivalent but different election in the last 12 months. To vote in the election of the senator for Marive, an Imperial Orc must have a military unit based in Marive, must have supported an Imperial Army in the last year, and must not have been eligible to vote for the senator of Skarsind last winter. They have put together a list of those eligible to vote for the Senator Marive based on those who meet the criteria. The fact the Imperial Orcs now have two territories finally brings jokes about the unanimous decision of the Imperial Orcs Senator to an end. It also means that any currently vacant positions, such as the General of the Summer Storm, that are elected by unanimous decision of the Senators of the Nation cannot be elected until Saturday, when the second Senator is elected. This being the first time the Imperial Orcs have had two senators, there are likely to be questions which can be directed to Merlo, the overseer of Imperial elections. Smoothing the hard edges. Former Salt Lord Aesan and the Orcs of Beri have a vested interest in the senator for Marive. As a consequence, it's become clear that factions within the city are watching with interest to see who claims the title. They make no secret of the fact that they would be keen to see the Senator of Marive keep an eye on their own interests, as well as those of the Imperial Orcs in the wider territory. As a consequence, whoever becomes Senator for Marive will experience a steady flow of gifts and open bribes intended to incline them towards the inhabitants of Bury and Sinfiard. Each season, the Senator will receive an income of ten crowns. They won't be expected to do anything for this money, at least not immediately, but if the Empire's relationship with Bari collapses, there will be no more gifts. The strong implication is that they believe the Senator is in a position to ensure that Salt Lord Aesan's interests are appropriately looked after. The money is going to keep coming in whether the Senator likes it or not. They may feel compromised, or they may simply accept it as one of the perks of doing business with former Grendel. There's nothing to stop them donating the money or returning the gifts. The additional coins can just be handed in at God. Nobody will know one way or the other, unless the Senator tells them. Six Problems Much like Ossium, the regions of Marive have qualities that represent the challenges of settling the territory. In addition to this, there are some problems that affect the whole territory. Underdeveloped Icarian has the underdeveloped quality. Quality of infrastructure in the territory is highly variable. In places where it benefited the Salt Lords to build roads, the provision is excellent. Easily the equal of anything the Empire has to offer. But everywhere else has been more or less left to fend for itself. What passes for roads are rutted and full of potholes. Barely adequate by Imperial standards. Thus there are problems bringing good quality materials in and challenges finding skilled workers who are worth paying to build things. There are two obvious ways to tackle this via the port of Bury, or through the Apulian Way. Unfortunately, neither of these routes is entirely ideal. One faces tariffs from Aesan, the other the threat of having to pass through Spiral and the Black Plateau. As a consequence, the region of Icarian has the underdeveloped quality. The League, and especially the Apulian Orcs, might be able to help here. They have a lot of experience moving materials, and many of those living in Spiral have first-hand experience with the Orcs of the Broken Shore, and Aesan's city-state in particular. While any region of Marive has the underdeveloped quality, all commissions built in the territory have their labour costs increased by a fifth. Arid Icarian, Nadir and Eorodal have the arid quality. This means that they have little fresh water, with wells being valuable commodities. They are also sparsely settled, with most of the permanent settlements being mining communities. Building permanent settlements here will be a challenge, as will establishing any fortifications. It is probably no coincidence the Grendel had not built any large-scale defences here on what was for centuries their only land border with the Empire. The status of these dry regions also impact farms here. While there are farms, they are not especially prosperous. The orcs hunt more than they farm, and there is little left to sell. This same problem will impact the Imperial Orcs' ability to settle the territory. While any region has the arid quality, farms in the territory take a minus one penalty to production. Commissions relating to farms, or whose flavour involves the production of food, cannot be created without an opportunity. Perversely, the lack of water does provide some protection to the territory. 
The spring curses rivers of life and rivers run red rely on existing groundwaters to flood with the teeming energies of the spring realm. Those groundwaters are deep here, too deep to have much impact at present. Neither curse will be effective while any region in the territory is arid. There will still be visible effects from the curses, but they won't impact the local populace or armies fighting in the territory to any appreciable degree. There are two nations that might be able to offer the Imperial Orcs some support in converting these regions and allowing them to support arms. The Brass Coast has a lot of experience working with dry plains, although even in Segura there is more water than is found in Marive. The marches are fertile and wet, but the marchers are the acknowledged masters of agriculture in the Empire. If anyone can find ways to grow crops in land that is almost desertified, it is them. Their assemblies might use statements of principle to ask their people to offer their expertise, although both nations have their own problems. Failing that, a suitable appraisal by the Senate might identify ways to help address the aridity of Marive. In this case, it is worth noting that the appraisal would need to be focused on the status of these regions. It wouldn't be as effective if it was just a general help Marive appraisal or statement of principle. Eoradal suffers due to a lack of access to fresh water, and the settlements scattered across the region are only as large as the wells allow them to be. To the east of the region, among the Scouran ruins, however, stands the remnants of what would at one point have been an immense aqueduct. There are a number of ways of looking into rebuilding the aqueduct, almost certainly smaller, and using the remaining structures as much as possible. If the Imperial Orcs wanted to create a wonder, akin in majesty to the Colossus of Savos, then either an appraisal or help from the Scourons themselves would be the best course of action. Indeed, speaking to the Scourons might make sense, as the water the aqueduct would draw on would come from their mountains. The last thing anyone wants right now is to be accused of water theft. Uncooperative Clizern, Iordal and Fleizar have the uncooperative quality. While there are orcs scattered across Icarian and Nadir, they are cautiously interested in the Imperial Orcs. Many of them have connections to those of the Sanite Sept, while others are simply disinterested in the fact that the bosses have changed. They expect the change in Landlord to have little impact on their lives. The same cannot be said for the orcs in the southern half of the territory. Many of the orcs fled either to Bari or south into Ayarid. Those in Clizern who remain were wealthy Grendel or valued miners and engineers, resentful of the tumbling status they have experienced with Imperial conquest. The Brine Turtles Sept of Flyzard have only recently been conquered and still support an army in service to the Grendel. They are enthusiastic about the idea that the Empire will soon be removed and the status quo restored. Some of the Orcs of Iorodal are Brine Turtles, while others did well out of offering service to the Grendel. They do not welcome the presence of Imperial armies in the territory. The problems in the south of the territory are perhaps best addressed with either diplomacy or military might. The people here do not welcome the Imperial Orcs or the Empire, and changing their minds will take time. It might be easier to drive them out with armies, but doing so would send a dismal message to the rest of Marive that the Imperial Orcs might be cautious about. Ironically, the Imperial Orcs are perhaps best positioned to deal with the people of the territory. The Sanite Sept in particular might do well in leading negotiations in the south, although they will need to navigate those who consider them traitors for joining the Empire. All three of these territories have the uncooperative quality. Any Imperial army stationed here has its upkeep increased by a tenth for every region that has the quality and as long as any region has that quality, the territory cannot support an imperial army. Under threat. Flezard has the under threat quality. The orcs of the Brine Turtle Sept don't just despise the imperial orcs as lackeys of the empire who have made a deal with the widely disliked Aesan. Many of them actively welcome the day their warriors and those of the Grendel return to the territory and drive the empire out. Flezard represents a gateway to the entire territory, and the Grendel will not be shy about taking advantage of it. The region of Flyzard has the under threat quality, reflecting the fundamental disloyalty of the inhabitants there. Winning them over would remove the problem, but that will not be easy. Far Frontier 
Some of the issues with routes to the territory have been somewhat resolved given the treaty with Buri guarantees access to the Bay of Katazar, albeit with tariffs. Access to the bay doesn't help with moving armies in and out of Mareev, though. That still relies on using the Apulian Way to travel through Spiral. There is no clear way that the Imperial Orcs or the Greater Empire could resolve this issue. It is a geographical fact that the territory is in an awkward position related to the rest of the Empire. Moving troops there will be difficult, and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. Looming Threats the risk of the Grendel returning is high. There is no ritual that could be performed, no eternal that could be entreated, and no appraisal to be commissioned that would stop them from wanting to reclaim Mareev. At the moment, the sullen resistance of the populace and the difficulties of feeding large numbers of troops mean that stationing Imperial armies here might be challenging. An alternative might be to establish fortifications and armies in the territory to defend it from a Grendel invasion. The treaty with Bari means that the coast at least is safe, but that still leaves Clizern and Flyzard open to assault from the south and southeast. Six Septs While any Imperial nation would have faced challenges in Mareev, the Imperial Orcs have some advantages in dealing with the people and the harsh land. One of their strengths lies in their six Septs. The Tamatsi, the Ethengror, the Illaraum, the Sanites, the Sunstorm, and the Yurende. They represent a number of different approaches and attitudes that might bear dividends if they were brought to bear in Mareev. For the next year, the Imperial Orcs Assembly can pass the following mandate once each summit, starting at the summer solstice, but they must name a different sept each time. We are one nation woven from six strong strands. Each of the Septs has its own expertise that will help us show the people of Mareev we are not their enemies. We send named priest with 25 doses of Liao to urge the Sept to seek ways we may make Mareev a home for our people, by specific guidance. Synod Mandate, Imperial Orcs National Assembly When this mandate is passed, members of the named Sept will make a point of travelling to Mareev to explore the opportunities there. It will help some who were uncertain about whether to move there permanently to make up their minds. The event after it is enacted, it will present an opportunity to the Imperial Orcs in Mareev, in line with the particular expertise of the Sept named, and potentially benefits specifically for that Sept. The Assembly can offer guidance as to the thing they think will help. For example, they might urge the Yurende to find ways to grow herbs or to identify problems that need pruning or the Illaraum to speak to the Orcs about their relationship with their ancestors, or the Tamatsi to seek out magicians and magical places that might aid in the settling of the territory. Unlike a normal mandate, this mandate remains available to the Imperial Orcs until the end of the Spring Equinox 387YE, assuming the situation in Mareev does not substantially change. Trade Goods at the same summit the territory was assigned to the Imperial Orcs, the sibling of Lord Aesan met with Finna, the ambassador to the Grendel, and Yarek Orzel, the Imperial Consul, to negotiate a treaty that saw the city-state of Bari retain the regions of Bari and Sinfiard, amongst other things. The reaction from the folk of Bari has been lukewarm at the idea of priests of the way showing virtue to them. They have their own virtues, and trying to bring religion into it would just make it messy. What they are interested in, however, is trade. No citizens of Bari are attending the upcoming summit at Anvil, but Lord Aesan is willing to accept missives with opening offers, along with any other reasonable trade pitches. Xavier of the Spire of the Astral Torrent, an architect of the Golden Pyramid, spent weeks in conversation with the people of Bari and has some advice for any Imperial citizens interested in trade with the city-state. For a starter, they appear to have a keen interest in acquiring Dragonbone, and are willing to exchange Cerulean Mazarine from the herb gardens that dot Sinfiard for it at a rate of three drams for every two measures. Any Imperial Orc or member of the Golden Pyramid who is interested in making the exchange should send a winged messenger to Aesan, indicating how many measures they wish to sell. You must have this many measures in your inventory at the start of downtime. Shrine of the Way 
One of the terms of the treaty is that negotiations will occur in respect to buying land for a construction of a building to the way. In true Grendel style, and in a move the League no doubt recognise, Lord Aesan puts his initial offer on the table. If the Empire wishes, they can simply take advantage of the opportunity presented. Otherwise, they can use it as the basis for a negotiation. Aesan offers a plot of land in the absolute worst section of Bury. There is an old well there, and very little else. The land will not support a grand temple, but would be enough for a shrine with a few books and a small stage to preach from. It would not be enough land to build a large church or temple such as would warrant a title to look after it. This would effectively be a folly. If the Empire want to build a bigger, more impressive church, they will need to negotiate for more land. The more wains required for the commission, the bigger the plot of land will need to be. Whatever happens, the Empire will have to make Aesan an offer for the land, since they promised to buy it from him. The traditional Grendel way to open negotiations would be for the ambassador to provide a sealed letter with their offer on it, while Aesan does likewise. The ambassadorial civil service will facilitate the receipt of Aesan's offer if the imperial consul includes details of their offer in any winged message sent to the Salt Lord. Fundindelve One final matter concerns the mine of Fundindelve. While a lot of the rest of the territory was a little underdeveloped, the mine is extremely well built and maintained. Former Salt Lord Aesan took his responsibilities very seriously. The prosperity of the mine was a source not only of his power as a Salt Lord, but of his own personal ambition. The mine lies deep in the mountains of Clisern, and produces 22 wanes of mithril each season. While the territory was assigned last season, the mine was not allocated at the same time. The civil service have been hard at work here ensuring it is operational and negotiating on the Empire's behalf with those who previously worked the mine. Fundindelve is now operational and producing mithril for the Empire. The Imperial Senate can choose to allocate the mine as either an Imperial seat or a national seat. If it is allocated as an imperial seat, then it will be available on the open auction along with the other mithril seats. If it is allocated as a national seat, then only an imperial orc citizen will be eligible to stand for the position, and it will be appointed by tally of the votes. Assuming they allocate it during the summer solstice, it will be available as a seat for the first time at the autumn equinox 386YE. Appraisal there are many challenges facing the Imperial Orcs in Mareev. One tool the Empire has at its disposal that might help them is that of appraisal. There is a lot to do in Mareev, however. Too much for a single appraisal to provide all the answers. The prognosticators would do their best, and any one of the current roster would have things to offer here. But the Senate should take care. The more general the request the Senate makes, the harder it will be for the prognosticators to address specific problems. It would be better for the Senate to identify key issues, the sullen population, the difficulty of moving materials around the territory, the arid plains, the need for fortifications, the challenges of diplomacy with Aesan, and so on, rather than use a general help the prosperity of Mareev appraisal and hoping for the best. Rain in Mareev In the months following the spring equinox, a magical aura settles over Mareev, unnoticed by all save the most perceptive magicians. Several times as the seasons change, there is a smattering of unseasonal rain. Where the rain touches, flowers briefly flourish, lilacs breeding in the dead lands. Sadly, those plants die quickly once the rain stops, at least in the arid northern regions. They last a little longer in the south, but even there they fail to flourish. The spring magic Regrow the Land's Heart struggles to find purchase in Mareev, but it does have some effect. Some of the marks of war in the territory are soothed away. Some of those angered by the betrayal of Aesan or the flight of the Brine Turtles adopt a more pragmatic view. Yet these are broken shore orcs, not prone to sentimentality and inclined towards a kind of chill practicality in matters of war. But in the end, Neither the Imperial nor Grendel armies went out of their way to cause unnecessary destruction. 
They didn't slaughter or tyrannize, didn't burn or ruin. Even the attack on Rukrak's Eyrie was comparatively tame. People died, but the castle itself was mostly untouched. It isn't the lack of rain here that causes the ritual to have less impact. It's the fact that the kinds of scars it was created to address simply aren't present in sufficient quantity for its effects to be noticeable.